Heaven. 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 Most of us have a picture in our minds what heaven's really like. Pearly gates. Streets of gold. A holy city. Angels. God's throne. But how much of what we know about heaven is actually from the Bible? What is fact? And what is fiction? We all have some questions about our eternal destination. I've heard there will be a new earth and a new heaven. What does that mean? Will God completely destroy the earth and start over? If God does start over, what will it look like? Will we live on earth again? The crazy thing is, God has answers if you know where to look. He has revealed so much about your heavenly home. There's more to heaven than you think. And it can change your life. And change your life. There's more to heaven than you think. And it can change your life. And now, here is the host of Turning Point, Dr. David Jeremiah. If we could put the movie of world history on rewind and be transported back a few hundred years, we, the industrialized nations of the world, I mean, would probably do a few things differently to take better care of the earth that God created. While we can't undo the past, we can certainly be better stewards today. And there's one more thing we can do. We can look forward to the new heaven and new earth that God has promised to create. That's the title of today's message, the new heaven and the new earth. You might be surprised at what the Bible reveals about what is going to happen to this planet before eternity begins. So stay tuned and we'll study it together right here on today's edition of Turning Point. Next stop, heaven. See beyond this world on a fascinating tour of your heavenly home. Dr. David Jeremiah is your guide in Answers to Questions About Heaven, an honest, straightforward answer book to give you a clearer view of your eternal destination, what we'll do there, who we'll see, and why it matters. Not what popular culture says about heaven, but what God says. Have you ever wondered, do I have a guardian angel? Will heaven be boring? Do children go to heaven when they die? Why should I care about heaven? Scriptural answers to these questions and more, 75 in all. Request your copy for a gift of any amount. And if that gift of support totals $60 or more, Dr. Jeremiah will send you his comprehensive Revealing the Mysteries of Heaven study set. You'll receive answers to questions about heaven and Dr. Jeremiah's current teaching series on 11 CDs, paired with a correlating study guide. Plus, stay focused on your eternal rewards with the Going for the Gold cards included free. Bring into view an amazing picture of your future home. Request answers to questions about heaven or the Revealing the Mysteries of Heaven set. Contact Turning Point today. Within the heart of every man and woman, there lies a longing for a golden age on this earth. It is as if we all know that our paradise was lost in the Garden of Eden, and we hunger to have it restored. We want it back. All through the history of our race, this hope has emerged from time to time with the anticipation of an era when the earth would be at peace and at rest, and we would experience the golden age. This is exactly what the Lord himself taught us to pray when he gave us the Lord's Prayer. When you pray the Lord's Prayer and you say, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, that is what you are praying for, that the conditions of heaven will be found at last on this earth. Now, those of us who have some theology know that that is not going to ever happen during the current reign of death on this earth, but it is the hope that is in every heart. This is the proper expectation of the people of God. It is in the Lord's Prayer, and in, we are taught to pray this by the Spirit of the Lord. And this is what the writer of Hebrews had in mind when he was describing some people who had suffered greatly and were managing to get through that suffering because they had a hope. It says, for those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland but now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. They have a hope within them. And it was the hope for that eternal utopia that got them through the tough times of suffering. Whether we know it or not, men and women, we're homesick for the Garden of Eden. In every being, there is a desire for what our first parents enjoyed. We desire a perfect and a beautiful earth. 
We want everything restored that was lost. We can't help ourselves. It's programmed into the software of our humanity. This dream finds its expression in many beautiful passages in the Scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New. So I want to go with you, first of all, to the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. That's Roman numeral one, the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. If you read the Bible carefully, you will discover that salted throughout the Scripture are little promises that this is what is going to happen. For instance, in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 22, we read, For the new heavens and the new earth which I will make will remain before me, says the Lord. Isaiah envisions a time when there will be a new heaven and a new earth and it will last forever. He said it will be before me forever. Later on, Isaiah also reports that this new heaven and this new earth will be so wonderful, so completely beautiful, that it will cause us to forget what we know about the earth as it is today. Listen to Isaiah 65, 17. And behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or even come to mind. Peter suggests that this new heaven and this new earth will be a place where righteousness dwells. 2 Peter 3.13, we read these words, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Notice what the writer John says from his position on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1 and then verse 5. Here's what he says. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. That's the promise of a new heaven. Almighty God has said to us through John the Apostle that one day he is going to make everything about this earth and these heavens new. Now I want to talk with you secondly about the purification of the new heaven and the new earth. First of all, let's look a, at some information. Turn now in your Bibles away from Revelation chapter 21, back just a few books to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, as you're finding your way in 2 Peter, let me just tell you that when you put together all of the information in the Old and the New Testaments, you discover that the new heaven and the new earth will not appear until the following things happen. First of all, there will be a time of tribulation, seven years, at the end of which there will be a great battle called the Battle of Armageddon. Then there will be ushered in a period of time for 1,000 years called the millennium. I'm going to talk about that next week. At the end of the millennium, there will be a final rebellion and Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. The great white throne judgment will take place and all those who have rejected Christ throughout history will be, will be coming before the great white throne judgments to hear these words, depart from me, I never knew you. And all of the evil of the earth will be judged and sent to the lake of fire. Immediately after that, John 21 says, Almighty God is going to purify the earth. Now watch what happens. Almighty God is going to do something that most people are quite surprised to learn about. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. That is going to happen, according to the scripture, immediately after the millennial period, after the thousand year reign of Christ on this earth, Almighty God is going to do a purifying work on the earth as we see it today. Now what does the Bible mean when it says that heaven and earth will pass away? For as long as I can remember, I have believed that this earth and the heavens that surround it would be annihilated, totally destroyed. Often I've heard preachers describe this in dramatic sermons as they talk about the Holocaust, as they talk about the, the, the coming days when the atomic bombs and the hydrogen bombs and the neutons would all be destroyed and everything would be totally, totally annihilated. 
In other words, God was going to give up on this world, totally wipe it out, and start all over from scratch. I now realize that I was mistaken in my understanding, and so are many others, as I have learned. I am comforted by the knowledge that many teachers who have had thought processes like my own confess to having believed that and then having discovered as they studied the Bible that that wasn't true. In fact, uh, one young man who is a great student of heaven has written a tremendous book on the subject called Heaven, Randy Alcorn, says this in his book. Listen to this. For many years as a Bible student and later as a pastor, I didn't think in terms of renewal or restoration. Instead, I believed God was going to destroy the earth, abandon his original design and plan, and start over by implementing a new plan in an unearthly heaven. Only in the past 15 years have my eyes been opened to what Scripture has said all along. Now let's look once more at this passage in 2 Peter. Notice what he says. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up and the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire. The word burned up in that passage of Scripture does not appear that way in the early Greek manuscripts. In fact, if you have a copy of the New International Version, it translates that phrase, laid bare. The actual word in the text conveys the idea of being uncovered or laid open for exposure. In other words, Peter is not talking about destroying the earth, but rather about purifying the earth. Another key word in this passage is the word new. Listen to what Henry Morris says about this passage. You know what, I'll go to war with Henry Morris on the Bible, because I know he knows the word of God. And this is what he says. In both the Old and New Testament passages, the words for new mean new in respect to existence. That is, a new heaven and a new earth could be properly translated a fresh heaven and a fresh earth it is just like the first, except that all of its age-long ravages of decay have been expunged, and it is fresh and new again. Are you with me? Are we all together here? All right, we've talked about the information and the interpretation. Now, I want to give you an illustration, and isn't it wonderful that the illustration is right in the Bible, <laughs> right in the same passage of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. This is about the flood that took place during the time of Noah. Are you with me? Here we go. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Now, what could this possibly have to do with the new heavens and new earth? Listen now carefully, because this is key. Peter gives to us the key of understanding fire by telling us about water. He helps us comprehend the meaning of the final purging of the heaven and earth by describing the earlier purification that took place in the days of Noah. Now I want to ask you some questions. Did the flood in Noah's time annihilate the earth? Did it? The flood was certainly destructive and cataclysmic, but it did not obliterate the world. God preserved Noah and his family so that they could re-inhabit the world that was made ready for them by the cleansing and purification of the flood. In the same manner, God will not cause the present earth to cease to exist by the fire that will come at the end of the age. The fire will have a much greater purifying effect upon the world than water did, but it will not destroy the world. And just as Noah and his family were protected in the ark, God's people will be protected in the New Jerusalem, which we discovered recently is not on the earth yet, but is hovering above the earth. We'll be present that will be our ark of safety during the purification of the earth. So we have the promise of a new heaven and earth. And we have the purification of the new heaven and earth. And now I want to give you, thirdly, some principles of the new heaven and earth, which are truly, um, they, are, they set you back on your heels, I'll tell you. Because I want to tell you what this is all going to be like. When this new heaven and new earth is finished, and God has purified it, and it's still the same earth and still the same heaven, but it has been purged, it's been made fresh, and all of the sin stains are gone, and all the evidences of death are gone, and all the... Signs of disease are gone. What is the world going to be like then? Well, go back to Revelation 21 with me, verse 1, and let me give you one thing we know for sure. 
And this will shock some of you. It may even disappoint some of you, but I hope you'll be all right with it when we get done. Revelation 21.1 says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. You say, well, I can't imagine a world that's beautiful without the sea. Well, don't forget that in the New Jerusalem, Flowing down from the throne of God, there is a river. And it is a great river that runs out into tributaries, and it's fresh water, not salt water. Because you see, salt is a preservative so that decay won't take place. But in the new heavens and the new earth, there'll be no decay, there'll be no need for salt. And the fresh waters will flow out throughout the world, and it'll be more beautiful than anything you can imagine with the trees that are growing side by side along the river with different fruits every month which you can pick off and eat and with leaves that provide a quality of life that is beyond anything we have ever known. So give God just a little bit of credit here that if he made the seas in the first place and they're attractive to us, when he remakes the earth and makes it fresh, watch what he does. No more sea. The removal of the sea is the first thing I want you to note. Secondly, I want you to note the reversal of the curse. Notice verse 3 of chapter 22 in Revelation. Revelation 22, 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and the servant shall serve him. Now, what is the curse? It's not what you hear at work every week. It's not the language of the street. The curse is a particular event that took place. And you remember when that happened? In the Garden of Eden, because man violated God's commands, God cursed the earth. Let me refresh your memory. Uh, go back with me to the book of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3 and following, verse 17. Here's the curse. Then to Adam God said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, but thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That's the curse. It's the curse of death and decay. Now, the Bible says, when we get to the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no more curse. The curse will be reversed. Because of man's fall into sin, a curse was pronounced over this creation. And God sent his son into the world to redeem that creation from the results of sin. And the work of Christ is not just to save the innumerable throng of blood-bought people. The total work of Christ is nothing less than to redeem this entire creation from the effects of sin. That purpose will not be accomplished until God has ushered in the new earth, until paradise lost becomes paradise regained. Finally, the third thing, not only the removal of the sea and the reversal of the curse, but number, number three, letter C, the restoration of all things. Ephesians 1.10 puts it this way, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, at the end of time, God might gather together in one all things in Christ. Now watch this. Both which are in heaven and which are in earth in him. God's plan of the ages is to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Today, there is a great separation between heaven and earth. But when Paul uses the term all things, he's being very inclusive. Nothing will be left out. Christ will make heaven into earth and earth into heaven. And the wall that separates heaven and earth will be forever demolished. There will be one universe and all things in heaven and on earth will be together under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's plan is that there will be no more gulf between the spiritual and the physical worlds. There will be one cosmos, one universe united under one Lord forever and ever. This is the unstoppable plan of God. This is where history is headed. This is where we're all going, to a new heaven and a new earth. The lesson is what most moderns would call a paradigm shift. How does this change our thinking? Let me just give you two thoughts. Number one, gives you a new appreciation for the world in which we now live. You know, as Christians, we have a reputation of being very poor ecologists. We have a reputation of always bad-mouthing the tree-huggers and all that sort of thing, you know. 
And you know, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I don't believe that's true, but I understand why it could be true. Because you see, if a Christian believes that this world is just a temporary thing that's not ever going to have any purpose in the future, and our home is up there, and this earth is no good, and it's trashy, and it's going to be totally destroyed, why would you spend any time trying to take care of it? Even though that's one of our commands in the early part of the book of Genesis, to care for the earth. Well, you see, when you understand that this earth is not going to be destroyed but refreshed, when you understand that this earth in some measure that we may not fully understand is going to be a part of your future destiny, your future home forever and ever, you will look at this world in a whole different way. Sometimes when John says not to love the world, we misunderstand. He's not talking about the created world. He's talking about the world system. He's saying don't love the system of the world, but don't stop loving the world. This is my father's world. It's a beautiful world he's created. And we almost discredit God by our attitude toward this world sometimes. God created this in the beginning. And yes, we've messed it up for him. But one day, praise the Lord, he's going to come back. And in one moment of time, he's going, to, he's going to just totally fix everything that's been messed up in the world that he created when he said, let there be light, will again be the pristine world of our creator God. And we shall live and reign with him forever and ever. A new appreciation for the world in which we live. And then secondly and lastly, a new appreciation for the world to which we're going. A little girl was visiting the country, and she was struck by the brilliance of the night skies. She said to her mom, Mom, listen to this, if heaven is so pretty on the wrong side, what in the world is it going to look like on the right side? <laughs> That's my sentiment exactly. The right side of heaven is certainly splendid beyond comparison. It is a place characterized by laughter without tears and life without death and singing without mourning and contentment without crying and pleasure without pain. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be there and our loving Heavenly Father will be there and the Blessed Holy Spirit will be there and there will be a new heaven and a new earth crowned by a resplendent city called the New Jerusalem. And my friend, I'm going there. I'm going there. And I don't have all the answers. I can't figure it all out. But the same God who magnificently created this world is going to refresh this world. And one day, we are going to rule and reign with him in this perfect place called heaven. And the only way I can tell you that that can be yours is by giving you the same formula that God gave me. Here it is. He said through his son Jesus, I am the way. Not, I am not one of the ways. I am the way. The truth and the life. Now listen to this. This is very exclusive. This is really, this is really not politically correct. This is just biblically correct. Here's what he said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man comes to the Father except through me. You want to live on this earth refreshed and made beautiful by the Lord? in a place we call heaven in the New Jerusalem, you better make sure you have made your peace with God through Jesus Christ. And you ask him to be your savior and Lord, and he will do it. And he will do it right now, right here, right where you are. As beautiful as it is, our earth is only a tarnished version of God's original glorious creation. The entrance of sin affected not only people, but the planet. Fortunately, Jesus Christ came to remove the curse of sin and make a new heaven and new earth possible. He also made it possible for you and me to become new creations by being born again. I hope you have placed your faith in Christ and received the gift of new life that he offers. And I would love to encourage you in your consideration of Christ by sending you two free resources a booklet called Your Greatest Turning Point, and our monthly devotional magazine called Turning Points. And we will gladly send them both to you free of charge if you'll contact us here at Turning Point. Next stop, heaven. See beyond this world on a fascinating tour of your heavenly home. Dr. David Jeremiah is your guide in Answers to Questions About Heaven, an honest, straightforward answer book to give you a clearer view of your eternal destination, what we'll do there, who we'll see, and why it matters. 
Not what popular culture says about heaven, but what God says. Have you ever wondered, do I have a guardian angel? Will heaven be boring? Do children go to heaven when they die? Why should I care about heaven? Scriptural answers to these questions and more, 75 in all. Request your copy for a gift of any amount. And if that gift of support totals $60 or more, Dr. Jeremiah will send you his comprehensive Revealing the Mysteries of Heaven study set. You'll receive answers to questions about heaven and Dr. Jeremiah's current teaching series on 11 CDs, paired with a correlating study guide. Plus, stay focused on your eternal rewards with the Going for the Gold cards included free. Bring into view an amazing picture of your future home. Request answers to questions about heaven or the Revealing the Mysteries of Heaven set. Contact Turning Point today. Thank you for watching Turning Point. For a complete audio or video copy of today's message by Dr. Jeremiah, simply contact Turning Point today. Request answers to questions about heaven when you send a gift of any amount in support of this program. For a donation of $60 or more, upon request, you'll receive the Revealing the Mysteries of Heaven set, containing answers to questions about heaven, Dr. Jeremiah's current heaven teaching series, and the correlating study guide, plus the Going for the Gold cards included free. You may also request a complimentary copy of Turning Point's devotional magazine when you contact Turning Point today. In the U.S., write to P.O. Box 3838, San Diego, California, 92163. In Canada, write to P.O. Box 187, Maple Ridge, B.C., V2X 7G1. Next week on Turning Point... We will have sharper minds, stronger bodies, clearer purpose, and unabated joy, and we will serve the Lord for a thousand years on this earth as it is reigning and ruling with him. Can you imagine a reign of righteousness with all godly people in every single position, having not had to be elected there, but appointed there by King Jesus? This is Mark Larson. Thank you for being with us today. Join us next week for Dr. Jeremiah's message, What on Earth is the Millennium? here on Turning Point.